Voices from the Cloud is the name of our summer sermon series. Hebrews chapter 12 begins this way. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside everything, the weight and sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. The therefore that begins verse 1 is a response to chapter 11 and all that has come before. And in chapter 11, the writer of Hebrews has looked back into the Hebrew Bible and held up uh, examples. Those who have run their race really well. The writer is saying, they ran their race well, now let's run ours well. So each week this summer, we are focusing on a hero from the Hebrew Bible. We, we look at their race, their life to find direction and encouragement and wisdom for ours. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. I love that image. One of the things that comes to mind is a bleachers full of family and friends at the side of a little league or a soccer field. You know, when the little ones are playing, you don't go really expecting a great game. You go to encourage them. You go to cheer for them. You go to be supportive more than anything else. Well, I think that you and I, we have bleachers full who are there to cheer for us, to encourage us. Those who have gone before, bleachers full of saints cheering for us as we run our race of life, rooting for our success. So far, we've heard from Daniel and Esther. And today, the voice from the cloud is the voice of Ruth. You know, there are only two books in the Bible named for women, uh, Esther that we looked at last week and Ruth where we are today. If you know nothing else about the book and story of Ruth, you no doubt have heard these verses that we look at this morning. Do not press me to leave you or to run back, return back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. The word of God for the people of God today. Thanks be to God. You know, we, we hear those words most often as part of wedding ceremonies. Many couples have asked me that I read that verse as part of their wedding. But that's not the original setting. The original context was not a wedding. To really understand the story, we have to go back a little bit. We need to go back to verse 1 that begins this way. In the days when the judges ruled... That helps us to think about a time. If you think about the book of Judges, there were, those were the days of epic battles between God's people and their enemies. Uh, it was a time of mighty warriors and great heroes like Samson and Gideon and Deborah. And there were these grand events and there were these giants of the faith and they were changing the biblical world. But at the same time, there were people going about their everyday, ordinary lives. They were trying to raise crops and make a living. They were getting married and raising children, and they were mourning their losses. And the book of Ruth is about those very people, about ordinary, everyday people leading their everyday, ordinary lives in the face of love and hardship and hope. You know, we often think about God in the dramatic events, the parting of the Red Sea, the sudden conversion, the raising of the dead. But, but there aren't any miracles in Ruth. There's no angel choir, no resurrection. Instead, this is a book that reminds us that God also works in steady, ordinary, and unspectacular ways. The story begins in Bethlehem. A man named Elimelech, 
Elimelech, like all good dads, is trying to provide for his family. And he and his wife, Naomi, have two sons, and Mahlon and Kilion. Now, those just sound like odd names to us. But in the Hebrew ear, when this story was told, the the audience would have immediately gotten a sense of foreshadowing. There is a hint of what's about to happen in the names of these sons. We don't hear it in English, but the names of the sons were sickly one and wasting away. All right? That gives you a hint that things are not looking good for these two, right? So this family of four lives in Bethlehem, and there's a famine, which is kind of ironic because Bethlehem means the house of bread, and so there's no bread in the house of bread, and so Elimelech goes looking for a better place. He's looking, all he's looking for is a way to provide for his family. So this father packs up his family, and with all that they can carry, they migrate to a place where he has heard there is more opportunity. There's food. They go to the land of Moab. Now, things must have been really bad in Bethlehem for Elimelech to even consider going to Moab. Moab was the last place an Israelite would have wanted to go. Earlier in their history, it was with the women of Moab that the Israelite men married, and then that led to apostasy and worship of foreign gods. It was the Moabite Balaam that, uh, the Moabite king that hired Balaam to curse Israel and to try to destroy the nation. Uh, They were were the oppressors of Israelite. The, the Moabites were considered so bad that if you look in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 3, it says that no Moabite shall be present in the Israelite religious assembly. They were so bad they were banned from church. But when your family's starving, well, you do what you have to do. So he takes the family to food, and that food happens to be across the border in Moab. They leave Bethlehem trying to escape death, but unfortunately death finds their forwarding address and pursues them in Moab. First, the father dies. Naomi stays there with her sons. The boys grow up, marry local women, Orpah and Ruth. And after a time, the sickly one and wasting away, they both die, leaving Naomi and her daughters-in-law in in a desperate situation, three widows in a household. See, women in that world had no status, no economic power. A woman who died, uh, a woman whose husband died without a son was destined to be, to starve, to live a life of poverty. Naomi had no options. Uh, A household with three widows in it was the sort of the worst picture of desperation and hopelessness. Naomi had no option. She figured she was too old to get married. She can't have more sons. And so she resigned herself to a life of poverty and loneliness, which is kind of ironic. Naomi, her name means pleasant, but her life at that moment was anything but pleasant. She tells her friends, don't call me Naomi anymore, call me Marah, bitter, for the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. Naomi decides she's going back home. She, we don't know how, but she learns there's food in Bethlehem now, and so she decides she's going to go back home. She tells her daughters-in-law, go back to your people. The best chance for you to find husbands is to go back to your homes and look in the communities from which you came and No doubt there was a sense that seeing her daughters-in-law reminds her every moment of everything she's lost. So she sends them away. She sends them back home, and they both resist at first, and finally Orpah agrees to do as she's told and to go back home. But Ruth refuses, and those are the words that I read. Ruth pledges, "Don't, don't press me to leave you. Don't make me turn back. Where you go, I go. Where you live, I will live. Where your, your people shall be, your, my people. Your God, my God. And where you die, I will die. Ruth, Ruth the Moabite, the enemy. She leaves her people for the sake of her mother-in-law. 
She will live with Naomi. She will take Naomi's people to be her own. She will take Naomi's God to be her God. Now in the ancient world where you were born, your family of origin determined your identity and your religious worship. People didn't abdicate either easily. If they gave it up, it was usually because they'd been made a slave or at the tip of a spear or sword. To leave Moab would put Ruth as an outsider for the rest of her life. She would be outside because of a language barrier and a food barrier and social etiquette barriers and religious practice barriers. She would face the constant subtle and not so subtle reminders that you're not one of us. And yet Ruth abandons her people and her God and vows faithfulness and loyalty to her mother-in-law and the God of Judah. The outsider is the faithful one. The one who expresses and lives her commitment to God and God's people is the one who by law was excluded from worship. Now it's funny how things work out in time. We planned this series and we put Ruth on the calendar for this Sunday weeks ago. It's a story about immigration and immigrants. And then this week, really the last couple of weeks, the news cycles have been filled with nothing but stories about immigration and immigrants. We, we sometimes think and act like this is a new issue that has never been dealt with before, but But as you can see, the story of Ruth is is a story that's 3,000 years old, and it's a story of immigration and immigrants. A family looks for a better life, and so they cross a border. What I find interesting is that even within the Bible, there's disagreement. There is a debate about immigration going on in the Scriptures If we were to turn over and read Ezra and Nehemiah, the the leaders of the nation were saying in Ezra and Nehemiah, the way that we maintain our status, the way we maintain our orthodoxy is to get rid of all the outsiders, to ban them, to shun them, to outlaw them. Ezra and Nehemiah tried to purify Israel and maintain their ethnic identity by deporting the foreign wives and children. They tried to shun and push away. And the book of Ruth is a critique of those reforms of Ezra and Nehemiah. Ruth represents the minority opinion. Ruth is a witness of another way, a challenge from a Moabite woman. Ruth is a foreign woman and a wife and she does not diffuse the essence of Israel. Instead, she provides a a marvelous reversal of expectation. She turns out to be the Savior. In, In this story, God did not break into the world in miraculous action and raise the dead. Instead, God works through Ruth and her fidelity and faithfulness. It it means that the stranger, the widow, the the enemy woman becomes the unexpected model of loyalty and devotion and faithfulness. She's the one who represents God's faithful and unrelenting love for us in this story. It's a story about love and devotion from the stranger, the Moabite woman. She saves the line of David. It's the outsider that keeps the nation from extinction. In the view and plans of Ezra and Nehemiah, they sought to preserve the future by purging all the foreign influences. The seemingly simple story of Ruth is a counterclaim, and it's a theological affirmation that the God we worship is a God of all people. The God for whom Ruth abandons everything is the God of the lowly and the widow and the stranger and even of the enemy of the nation. Ethnic purity, it seems, is not what God demands or desires despite the dominant efforts of the ruling party. This God does not belong to one people but gathers all people into the family of God. 
Unless we think that this is just about Hebrew history some long, long time ago and has no implications for us, let's not forget that Matthew reminds us Ruth is the great, great, 27 times great grandmother of Jesus. Jesus is the offspring of a mixed race marriage and he comes of, from ancestry of dubious reputation according to Hebrew law. Jesus' own genealogy becomes a theological statement that, that all the nations, even the enemies of Israel, can be included. Even the ones the law says must not be, God says can be. Jesus' own history says all are welcome. All can be included. In a polarized world and, and in a polarized church, Ruth speaks to us of the possibilities, the great possibilities that can emerge when, when we live beyond and stop worrying about who is in and who is out. And we maintain faithful relationships with one another. In Ruth, we learn that an immigrant woman, a distant ancestor of Jesus, she was a forerunner and showed the very thing that Jesus will ask the disciples to do, to cling to him and let go of all the things that they had previously clung to, including religious presuppositions. Ruth says to us, be faithful, be loyal, and know that the love of God is not restricted by ethnic or religious boundaries. Her, her faithfulness, turns out, is, is not just lead to, to a relation, her relationship with Naomi or her relationship with God. But it's also evidence of how God works in our lives. That, that through faithful relationships, we experience the grace of God in life. An important theme of Ruth is that... Faithful human relationships reveal divine care. The way we extend love and fidelity to each other is an experience of God's love and fidelity to us. The book of Ruth is really one of the most beautiful stories of human solidarity in the face of hardship. Sticking together through it all. It, it reminded me of the African fable about the people who wanted to know the difference between heaven and hell. And they were given the chance to take a tour of both. And when they, uh, when they went to hell, they, they, they saw this long table and people sitting on both sides of the table. And the people were gaunt and they were starving and they were malnourished and they were miserable. And, and this table was heaped up with food. And they couldn't figure out, how is it that, that there's food and they're starving? And then they saw their arms. They were taped up with splints. They couldn't bend their arms to get food to their mouth. So the food was right there in front of them, but they were starving to death. And then they went to heaven. And they were amazed, surprised, really, that, that some of the things were exactly the same. There was a long table, and people were sitting on both sides of the table. And there was this pile of food all the way down the table. But the people were well fed. They were nourished, and they were happy. Their arms were just like the people in hell, taped straight, where they couldn't bend them. But instead of sitting there in misery, they survived by feeding the people across the table from themselves. And so it was not about me and my and mine. It was about us and ours. And that was the difference. Naomi and Ruth, their decisions to be in solidarity with one another, it saved them from starvation. It, it led to the salvation of the nation. Last year, our bishop asked us to read a book, a leadership book, that was really built around uh, um, the story of Lewis and Clark expedition. And that led me to read a few other things about Lewis and Clark. And one historian said he found it interesting that the success of this expedition depended on two women, Sacagawea and Watakawisi. These two women, two Indian women, 
were the key to the success of the whole Lewis and Clark expedition. With all of the planning and all of the supplies, with all of the armaments and all of the money and things they took to trade uh, with the Indians, with 30 plus men who were handpicked because of their wilderness skills and the captain's ability to navigate, uh, the success of the mission boiled down to the integrity and faithfulness of these two women. And if this had been a Hebrew story, they would have both been Moabites. You see, it was Sacagawea, the Shoshone, who made it possible for them to have horses and who navigated the path over the Rockies. And it was Watakawisi who convinced her people not to massacre the expedition. They were ready to go and wipe out the expedition, and she convinced her people not to do that. Both of these women were like Ruth. They had lived with foreigners, foreigners who their their people would later fight and fear. But both of them, like Ruth, demonstrated faithfulness and generosity and fidelity and trust and honesty and demonstrated that those human traits go beyond borders. Their deeds went largely unnoticed at the time, probably Because the world thought of them as nobodies, much like Ruth. So nobody paid any attention to them. But but because of their faithfulness, because of their fidelity, that expedition succeeded. Faithful deeds by even little people become the hinge on which history turns. The voice of Ruth says, be faithful, be loyal, be devoted. I think Ruth would encourage us to enlarge our picture of who is in the family, who it is that we support and who supports us, who it is that will be at that table where we feed one another. Ruth reminds us that some of these outsiders might have a clear vision of what God is calling us to do and be than we do. God is bigger than we are, bigger than our institutions, bigger than the boundaries that separate us in the nations and races and peoples. The the voice of Ruth encourages us to be faithful and devoted in our relationships with one another, to remember her story, to be open that God sometimes works in the unexpected way, through unexpected, maybe even unwelcome people. May God bless us as we are guided by the words of Ruth. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.